Okay, so I've got a couple of crazy ideas and I'm not too sure how I um, go about putting this together. I've never made a video before. So what I thought I would do is make a short video, show some pictures and then another little video to explain what I uh, can kind of come, come to conclusion about. Um, I hope the pictures will explain a little bit of why I've come to this conclusion. I'm not saying I'm right, it's just a theory. Um, I'll probably get thumbs down all the way. I'll probably be classed as a madman, but at least I'm trying. It was um, a crazy idea. And when I looked into it, it kind of seemed to all fit together. So I'm gonna start with a couple of basic things. Um, I don't know how much each person knows about Puma Punku, but I'm guessing if they've come and found this video, they probably know a few basics of what this site looks like. Uh, maybe they know a little bit more about it than I do. Um, so we start basically with the first couple of things that grab my attention. The, at Puma Punku, you have these kind of crazy little moats that run around the place and they look like at some point they held water. Now you've got one part of the uh, step pyramid which has this kind of like square tunnel running down a slight bank and it looks as if there was water at some point running through it. It's quite big and it's clamped together. They've used these uh, eye clamps uh, I don't know how much people know about these clamps so I'm just going to reel it off and talk about it and just hope for the best that you know um, a little bit more than I do and a little bit more about the, uh, the site. So you've got these eye clamps holding all these blocks together and they're alloy poured into these recesses that are carved in the tops of the blocks. The alloy itself um, it's a copper, arsenic, zinc, bronze alloy, which is very, very strong. And we actually use this um, alloy in modern things. There's many different things it's used for. So one of the things that I looked into was what we use this alloy for today, because the water is one of the main issues for me, why they have such a connection with water to this place. And if you look around the site, like I say, you have these strange little pond areas. On top of the step pyramid, there was a recess that at some point was, or what they assumed was filled with water. Not very deep, but, um, kind of carved into stone on the top of the, the pyramid there was this kind of crazy shape and they, it would have been filled with water well that's what it looks like on most of the pictures what I've read uh, what I've seen and the little things I've read about it so what you've got is this connection with Pumapunku and water and then you have the eye clamps holding these blocks together with this very strong alloy we use this alloy today for many different things, including pumps, like I'm guessing like a bicycle pump, the actual body of the pump. They use this today because it has a low friction rate. It's very, very um, low friction, this alloy. They even use it in bearings like you'd get in skateboard wheels or rollerblade wheels, bearings like this. this they use this same alloy in those bearings. And, um, it also has a marine use because it's very tough against sea water. It doesn't kind of have an effect on this alloy. So they use it in marine um, activities like with, um, you know, kind of like uh, parts to your boat, bolts. They use it for, um, I forget the name, like a, a shaft, is it? A shaft, a boat shaft. They use it for, um, rods, the actual metal rods, valves, which is another moving part. So it, it basically is a very, very strong alloy 
with a lot of good properties. Friction, so I'm guessing you know it stays at um, a reasonable temperature when things are rubbing against it. It has no kind of a serious wear on wear on the actual um, alloy itself. Um, you know, it's an incredible um, alloy that these people managed to uh, work out how to use it. And um, the other thing is, of course, they had these, uh, they must have had smelts and they must have been mobile because they've moved around the site, pouring these eye clamps with this um, alloy. So they were, must have been able to get the temperature up and still move around with it before it cooled down. So I'm guessing uh, they had some way of building up heat very quickly at a very high altitude where the air's thin. This wasn't a problem for them. They had no problem with this. And I read somewhere that, I don't know if it was the 30s or 40s, that was when we, as a modern race, managed to work out what alloys need what temperature to form together. So it wasn't really, if you look on the time scale, looking back, it wasn't really that long ago when we first discovered this out for ourselves of exactly what temperatures we needed to raise to get these to mould together and make this um, alloy. So, in essence, you've got a place that's bolted together with these alloy eye clamps, very strong, very tough. Um, and the connection with water, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming from what I was seeing on uh, a lot of the YouTube videos, they say that this, this particular tunnel that had water coming down it was pretty watertight and the eye clamps kept it together and it was very strong so they had no problem with sealing joints together making everything kind of almost airtight. So the one other thing I will mention on this quickly is that I see a few people's journals that have travelled through the Andes and made these little journals of each of these sites they visited like from Machu Picchu, Tiwanaku, Pumapunku, <clears throat> Throughout throughout the Andes, they went to different places and they kept this journal and they left they had pictures of the stuff they were looking at and particularly at Pumapunku, I know it's a couple of people and I've seen this on other videos as well where they've mentioned that these some of these stones at Pumapunku actually looked like they were used as molds, not that the actual stone itself was molded. I know there's a theory where they were they reckon these were poured like a concrete into a mold and that's what made these razor sharp edges and these beautiful carved stones but I'm talking about carving a stone with a recess and then pouring something in that and that may be you being used as a mold so a few people have mentioned this at Pumapunku they've seen these stones and they assume that they these were being used as molds for some reason now I would guess that it would have been this alloy these these um, these molds, these stones that were had carved out, were were to produce an alloy in a certain shape. And now I'll show you the pictures, and I'll try and put some captions underneath them of what I think and the reasons why I think these um, were molded and used um, in the construction of of what I'm trying to achieve in this video. I want to. I want to try and show you that I, th I think maybe they had a basic steam engine. And I know that sounds a bit crazy and um, like I say, I'm probably going to get thumbs down all the way, but I don't really care because it was just a crazy idea. I looked into the pictures, I, I've, I've kind of pretty much come up with most of what I would imagine that I was looking for to kind of uh, construct this. And it makes sense that people see these stones as moulds because um, obviously if you're constructing something like a steam engine you would need certain parts of metal and some of stone. So in this video I'm just going to go through some things and try and point out what I'm getting at and maybe we can um, 
at the end of it, I can kind of come to a conclusion and show you what, what, what I mean, what I was looking to achieve by this video, by putting all these pieces together. So I'm sorry, you'll have to excuse me if the video is such poor quality, um, very badly constructed, it will be. I've never done this before, and I've just tried to kind of grab all these pieces together, put them together. I've highlighted in red points I want you to look at, and um, yeah, we'll try and go for there, really. Let's go from there and see how this works out. Okay, so um, let's roll on with the pictures. Okay, so I've showed you the basics of how a steam engine works. I've pointed out each of the moving parts and shown you or made a point of saying to you to look at each shape of each moving part. Now what I'm going to show you is some more pictures. You're going to see some of the pictures you've already seen before and then I'm going to compare them to um, the other pictures but of the actual site of Pumapunku. Now, I don't want to get too carried away at this point because I still want to do another short clip at the end of this to kind of explain why each of these things work and what, why it would uh, come together to make a steam engine. So um, just watch the next pictures and you are, like I say, you are going to see pictures you've already seen, but I'm using them to compare the, the, the different sites. It's very short, so um, maybe you can make your own mind up after this and switch off if you want. But I suggest stay to the end and then you can see what my conclusion was. But um, I hope you like the idea and can see what I'm trying to get at. And then you can call me a nut job at the end of it crazy whatever you want to say but um, yeah I can't make it any clearer I hope the um, the video isn't too bad quality and that you can sort of understand what I'm trying to say
Okay, so the last thing I wanted to mention was um, basically, as we know, Pumapunku is under a lot of soil. Um, some parts of Tiwanaku are under six foot of soil. And um, that's a pretty ongoing thing for that kind of area. A lot of the, uh, the ruins are under um, excavation. They have to uh, dig this stuff out. So we're only seeing a very small part of it. Now, as I explained in my video, I believe that there was moulds uh, for the alloy. And not all the shapes make that steam engine or all the parts I could find, but a majority of them were pretty much there. Now I couldn't explain it very well in that video by drawing the little arrows. A lot of it's down to the person to actually observe, looking at the shapes of the actual steam engine and then looking at the shapes on the blocks, recognizing the difference between what's a mold and what's an actual design of the blocks, because they have a lot of um, unusual designs on the uh, blocks at Pumapunku. So, um, trying to keep this sweet and short now. Um, I hope I've kind of explained a little bit of what I was trying to get at. The gist is, they it seemed possible to me that they could quite easily mould the parts that they needed to build a steam engine. This doesn't explain half the mystery of Pumapunku because they had to cut this stone in the first place. Initially, my idea was, well, maybe they had a steam engine, they were able to make routers powered by steam and they were able to cut these stones, but that they still would have needed to cut the stone to make the, sorry, my cat's coming in saying hello. They would have still needed to um, cut the stone in the first place to be able to make parts of the steam engine. And I'm talking very simple, a square block, holes in it. They probably did use wood on some parts, maybe to join pieces together, I don't know, but a lot of it you can see from the diagrams that an actual steam engine is very, very basic. You've got a lot of the shapes there of a steam engine the cylinders, the joints, the air, the air intake or the water intake. You would obviously need it somewhere to heat the water in a, in a tank, in some kind of tank. Now, I was just reading only five minutes ago, that they found all these underwater, um, not tunnels, but water flow underneath the whole area of Tibanaco and Pumapunku. So they didn't have a problem with water. So when they were using the smelts and they were heating up this alloy, they must have discovered if they can heat alloy to that temperature at that height, they must have discovered steam coming off whatever they were heating. They might they must have learnt that steam can be harnessed. They must have known that there was a use for it. Now, none of this is on recorded history. Nothing is really talked about or mentioned. It's all pretty straightforward, mainstream point of view. And I don't disagree with a lot of it. I'm probably totally on the wrong track and I'm probably trying to just kind of Put things together and my and i'll be honest i've looked back at this video so far and i haven't been very happy with it it hasn't explained things the way i wanted to so maybe at a later date i'll um, make a more detailed video and kind of explain things in a lot more detail because i don't think it does it much justice for this idea and the way i've laid the video out with the pictures so um maybe next time i'll uh, try and get it together a bit better so yeah, th th it leaves it down to the same thing. There was still high technology going on in that place. One thing I will say is they did have diamonds in Peru. There's no mention of it. They've never found any tools. There's no mention of it in the books. They've never found any tools for any of these sites. 
So my guess is maybe they did use diamond and um, they did have sophisticated tools, just like Chris Dunn's theory on the Giza power plant and through his personal research, he believes that the Egyptians had far greater tools than what we give them credit for, um, for the precision they made on a lot of the uh, stonework. So I totally understand where he's coming from and I can see that that's obvious that something like that went on at Pumapunku. They had, I, the, the books I've read on the, how they reckon that most of Pumapunku, Pumapunku was done was done by hand and sand. But there was also different stones they used to carve this. But as we all know, if the, hard, the hardness of the stone, if it's not harder than andesite, then you're not really going to make much of an impression on it and copper tools wouldn't make a lot of difference and uh, there is no other stone harder than andesite other than diamond and diamonds are in Peru uh, so maybe they did maybe they learned how to adapt this and um, use some kind of tools but the mystery is still there. There's, there's, no, there's no way I've solved anything and this is just a crazy idea. Not very well explained. The video's not being put together too great so I'll probably let myself down on that side but the idea is there and it still makes you think, well, okay, these people, they say they didn't have the wheel, they didn't have a written language but yet you can clearly see that they had the idea of the wheel maybe not using it in the right way, but if you can create something as perfect and as beautiful as Pumapunku, I don't see how a wheel would really be some major um, mystery to them. They, they must have thought about it. The one thing I will say, and I will leave you on this, I don't want to go on anymore. I think you've been patient enough to sit to the end of my video and uh, slate me off as much as you like. I don't mind because it's, you know, I accept that. But the one thing I will say is, and everybody must have thought of this, before they laid one block at that site, somebody had a vision of that place. Somebody saw in their mind how that was going to fit together. Now that, to me, if it wasn't just one person, it may have been several people. But even so, to collaborate on something like that, on that scale, to that level of technology, that's incredible. There's nowhere else on the planet like Pumapunku. And it interests me so much. And I'm hoping maybe one day to go there. Um, it's, it, but whoever had that idea, whoever had that vision, that's like um, way ahead of, of anything. I mean, we don't even go that technical these days. I mean, you look at a lot of these modern houses, the way they're built, they're just literally a timber frame, slap some plaster up and, a, and, a, and stick some lead, uh, lead on the roof, and there you go. It's so simple, so basic. There's no need to go to any major precision with them. They're so simple. And straightforward I mean it's basically a lot of these new builds are like sheds with bricks put up so you know oh, okay you look at skyscrapers you can understand there's a technology there and it's great and but even so we we won't go to those kind of lengths for a precision and to uh, and for what for what reason why would you need to have that I mean okay if you're showing off some kind of intelligence some sort of beauty no, I mean, there is equally beautiful places on the planet, megalithic sites all over that are just as wonderful, just as beautiful, but nowhere quite the same to that level. It, it's just absolutely mind-blowing. And I, I can sit there and, and watch YouTube all day videos about this place because it is fascinating. Ancient lost technology, Advanced ancient civilizations, well, that to me they did exist. I totally believe that. I was caught between is it aliens coming and giving us knowledge. I was caught up in that for a while, and I still kind of 
I'm on the edge with that. I can see, I, w I wouldn't rule it out that we didn't have somebody come here at some point in history. I, w I wouldn't rule that out. It's not completely impossible in my mind, but there must have been a race of people on this planet far advanced than anybody else at that time. This knowledge that they had, you can see throughout Peru, um, how the Incas stuff, pre-Inca, everything before the Inca is so much um, more sophisticated, so much higher degree of technology involved. And then as time went on, it kind of got less and less. And then eventually it caught up. And they, you know, they talk about this in all kinds of videos. But this lost race of people, yeah, I do believe they existed. And I do believe that something like Puma Punku, once they had harnessed this um, knowledge, either these builders helped to build it, showed some interest, taught people how to to uh, make show them what is possible, what you can do. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer in this advanced ancient civilization, this lost, this lost culture that was um, somehow the knowledge that they had spread throughout the world and um, maybe it got watered down over time. It got less and less known about the basics of that knowledge was kept, but um, it took many people many years to finally tune these skills and be able to get up to that kind of standard. But um, Peru just fascinates me. There's, um, there's, there was just so many amazing cultures there, so much interesting stuff and the land's beautiful. And the um, the history is just you know phenomenal. Um, thumbs down to the Spanish for what they did. Not very happy with them. We would probably have a lot more to see um, if they hadn't have done what they did. But um, again, that's history. One race takes over another, and so on and so on. But I'm not going to waste any more of your time. I've tried my best. To try and piece together this my my last my last thing i will say i do believe maybe they could have quite possibly known how to make a steam engine i don't think it's something out of their reach and once they'd learned how to use a steam engine what would they use it for maybe it was uh, simply to power something else maybe to power water for pumps to pump water up there i mentioned earlier the issue with water Obviously, drinking water, feeding the crops, they were amazing with um, crop rotation and stuff like that. They, they, they were absolutely incredible. So water was an important part of them. That, that goes without saying. But um, I do believe that they would have studied water and used and got what they could out of it. There's, no, there's, nothing, to say, there's nothing to say they couldn't understand about steam power and they got the basic idea of it and they tried this. And they probably tried several times to try and you know, perfect it. Maybe it didn't work in the end, but they gave up. But they may they may have uh, tried for longer, and then it went on to something else, and then something progressed onto something else. Um, funny enough, I was reading earlier today. This guy was talking about these underground, the underground water that runs through Tiwanaku, these chambers of water, and basically, he was saying that. Maybe at Puma Punku, there was some sort of hydraulic system, some sort of pump to bring this water up or bring it down from Puma Punku, down from, yeah, bring it down to Tiwanaku from Puma Punku, maybe. So they had some sort of hydraulic pumps. But I imagine it would have all been brought up from Lake Titicaca. Now they say, how did they bring the water up to Puma Punku in the first place? How did they bring the water into Tiwanaku? Well, it's pretty obvious to me, they've got giant reed boats. Um, not all of them are giant, but they, they're pretty big. And what's to say they can't fill up the reed boat and carry it between so many men? Obviously, it's going to be heavy, but if you have a small enough reed boat, you fill up the reed boat with water and then they carry it up from Lake Titicaca, drag it up, you know, whatever. They had llama skins. So they plaited those into ropes. They had good strong ropes of some sort. So um, I don't think that's unthinkable uh, that they couldn't somehow.
bring water up from there. Maybe they did have some sort of, and you know, saying pumps, this guy in this, um, on this site I was reading, he was talking about Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, mentioning these underground areas of water. And there's something about them, like these tiny pockets, little pockets of water um, that come up through the ground, little, little holes where this water come out from. Um, him mentioning pumps, um, maybe they could somehow pump the water from one place to another. Now, I was talking in this video about how they use this alloy in modern times to make the body of a pump because the non-friction. The strange thing is, Lake Titicaca is, I don't know if it's half and half, half seawater and half fresh water, or more fresh water and small amount of sea salt water. So the pumps being made of this alloy, the salty water from Lake Titicaca wouldn't affect it at all. They have, it has no effect on this alloy. So, um, it's weird how they use it in modern times today, they use this alloy for the bodies on a pump. So it would have been the ideal, perfect material for the people at Pumapunku to make a basic pump. Um, and yeah, and to use this alloy for the body to make the pumps and to make other things as well, um, which is what I tried to explain in my video. A lot of the moulds you see, or what I class as moulds, there was a black and white picture I put up and it had all these different weird shapes and grooves cut out and there was one that was kind of like a sort of an L shape and then it had a funny little twist in it. It was practically the same shape as what was on a, an old school steam um, engine. The same kind of shapes. And they to me, would I would class those as moulds. So this alloy, somehow they were learning how to use this alloy to mould things and take shapes and build things with it. Where did all this go? Well, as far as I know, a lot of it was taken by the uh, conquistadors, the Spanish, when they went in. They pretty much took a lot of it. Funny thing is, it actually looks like, when these, when these eye clamps are poured, it does actually look like silver. They actually got a kind of silvery glow to them. They don't look bronzy. Um, kind of colour, you know, that kind of brownie, bronzy colour. They don't have that. They look more silver. And even over time, once they've corroded a bit, and you see the kind of, um, you know, the dirt build up, they still look like, um, kind of like a, you know, a tarnished silver effect. So yeah, maybe the Spanish thought they were silver. Maybe they were, you know, they were sort of some sort of kind of silver, they thought. And that's why they took them all, probably melted a lot of the stuff down took it back in bars, like they did with the gold, um, which was never to be seen again, or small, small bits were left. So yeah, maybe a lot of this stuff that was made at Pumapunku, out of these moulds, was taken away, melted down, taken back with the Spanish, who knows. And, and like I say, not forgetting that a lot of Pumapunku is still under soil. We're only seeing a small amount. So I guarantee there'd be more mould type stones and um, yeah, there's a lot more to it. So anyway, thanks for listening. If you did get to the end of my video, it's been a long one. You probably sat here for half an hour listening to this, wasting your time, thinking I could never get that time back. But you know, thanks for watching anyway if you do. And um, yeah, I hope it kind of explained a little bit of what I was trying to get at. Thanks.